Hi, Abel. Hey. This is the first time we talk where I don't have to pay money for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like to run a podcast. Yeah. Well, I used to be into money, but since I became a communist, I started doing it for free. Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, let, let's start with the consultation. So, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever invited anyone who I had a history with. So, this might be a good opportunity to to start out by by familiarizing my listeners to my tragic backstory regarding health and fitness. And uh, and and if we are doing it well, then it, it might shed right shed light into why you're here especially in the in the fit coiners series of my 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 podcasts mm -hmm. so what was your impression working with me it was i was surprised by your wide ranging uh, interests so i initially thought that you will just inquire about losing weight and strategies surrounding that. So I knew you had uh, some weight issues. I don't know how that's going at the moment. Um, but at the time, I know that you had some serious um, fat loss goals. And so I, I thought that it was going to be just about that. And then it slowly kind of dawned on me that, you know, like you just like to nerd out. I mean, you did have fat loss goals. Uh, so that never changed, but you just really enjoyed nerding out on these general fitness, uh, health, uh, longevity related uh, topics. And you just had a lot of questions, which often I didn't even know, like, where did you come up with that question? Or like, what did you come across that would inspire you to ask such a question? But yeah, it was just very interesting. Like, uh, curious people are always more interesting. So it was definitely uh, very thought-provoking for me as well. But you know what was the best part? Mm. That you accepted Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of, um, to be honest, I usually I'm, I'm just getting annoyed by Bitcoin when, like, that is the only way to pay or something on some website. Uh, but, but at the same time, it definitely has its perks. Like, that is not something that is going to get you into trouble later down the line, if that is the transaction that you leave behind. As far as I understand, maybe it will. Probably I understand it wrong. Like, as soon as I say something about a topic that I'm like really kind of clueless about, like it, it will turn out that I said something stupid. So probably you can correct me right away. No, I, I, I think that makes, makes perfect sense. You are trying to point out the privacy issues with Bitcoin, right? Well, so the privacy benefits of Bitcoin, I, I suppose, um, and the privacy issues with just online transactions. So like, if, if I pay with my credit card somewhere, then, you know, it has my name and address and whatever, every, everything on it. So also if I get payment online, same thing. And generally, the more things you do online, the worse it is, I guess, for your privacy. For most of us, it's not going to be relevant, but at some point, it could get you into trouble. That's sort of the way I look at it. So Bitcoin, to me, seemed like something that you basically just circumvent all of that. And, and but that, So that's what I thought, and that's why I said, like, I guess I might be wrong about that completely. Well, that's the goal. That's definitely the goal. Um, it, it is true that the privacy properties of Bitcoin is, is different from the privacy properties of the traditional financial system, right? Because in the traditional financial system, there is always a custody of your privacy. There is always someone who knows every transaction of yours. In Bitcoin, there is often someone who knows every transaction of yours, but there are ways around it. In fact, right now, there are two ways around the Join Market and Wasabi Wallet, uh, the latter which I have started. Mm -hmm. um, now, anyway, the reason why you're here is because you are, in my opinion, the best personal trainer for Bitcoiners. And because this is a series called Fitcoiners, the intersection between fitness and Bitcoin, 
uh, mm. I wanted to interview you and shamelessly promote you to Bitcoiners. Maybe someone will will want to have some consultation and nerd out on on fitness. And... Oh, well, let, let's see if I can live up to that. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. So the first rule of Bitcoin is that you always talk about Bitcoin. I've been going back and forth if we should start with the Bitcoin conversation or start with the fitness conversation. And I think let's start with the Bitcoin conversation because be sure we're already doing that. <laughs> and that will be probably the shorter one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did you learn about Bitcoin? Did I learn about Bitcoin? I guess I was a very, to be honest, I don't even want to say late adopter because like that would, I guess, use the terms early adopter, late adopter for something that, after, so you adopted it, but after that, it became a, like a very significant part of your day-to-day -day life. So like mobile phones, I'm a, whatever, normal adapter, I'm guessing, but I ever since I've been using mobile phones. It, it is not like that with Bitcoin, to be honest. Like, I'm very much, um, I guess, we talk about, like, party drinkers, party smokers. I'm a party Bitcoiner. So, like, uh, just occasionally for very distinct purposes, I use it. How I learned about it. So, so I remember some of those early conversations that I had where someone would mention it. And to be honest, like, I, I could just hear it popping up more and more. But I, I, I didn't even know what it was. So like so I remember this guy in a some bar. I was there with my well girlfriend at the time, and 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 he was telling me that like yes, yeah, so like some of these people like this guy was for example telling me that I I can get like a, a hundred bitcoins for this and this much money like it's just nothing, and it's like come on it's like such bullshit he, he was telling me and I'm like yeah yeah I guess like like I was thinking that bitcoin it must be some some storage related thing online because like bit you know megabyte whatever gigabyte <laughs> um and i am pretty sure that like i only actually put it together what it really is about when it came down to actually having to pay for something with that and then i'm like ah oh, okay so how does this work and then like okay so well, i guess i will have to buy some and then i saw that like okay i can buy here this is a reliable site that is recommended Okay, how much is one? And it's like holy shit! Like some anabolic steroids from the dark net. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not anabolic steroids, but yeah, like uh, it was you know like what gets onto the black market or like what what will be sold on some side that is considered shady is a little bit arbitrary. Unfortunately, it just has to do with whatever is available in your country or in most countries. Uh, but you know. Uh, some of those things might very well be longevity enhancing, right? Even. But so then I saw that like, my God, like one Bitcoin is already a fortune. So then I, I finally could put everything into context. Like, oh, so like when he said like a hundred Bitcoins, that's, that's quite something. So yeah, that's more, more or less my story <laughs> with how I came across it. Did, did you have some... Technical difficulties accepting it. Yeah. Um, well, purchasing it. Oh. So I, I had a lot of difficulties with that. Um, <laughs> like, which which I, I suppose is a good sign. But these websites, uh, I, I don't know, yeah. even sure like which one that was where I attempted the first time. But they would just decline my payments, and like the support people would not be authorized to tell me why. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, like I was just completely this kind of no man's land with it. So that's why, like, whenever I would want to get Bitcoin, like I would just use some personal exchange, um, like I did with you a number of times. And uh, my my last question regarding Bitcoin here is that: Have you met anyone who? who's been as deep into it as I am, or was I your first maximalist? So n never anybody who was as deep as you. I did meet a couple of people who said that they are investing into it. So they are like, like people are using the stock market sort of in that, that kind of fashion. 
so people like that I have met, but yeah, definitely you're the hardest core. And I mean, this is your, your career in some sense, right? Yes, it was, it was not, not anymore, or maybe I'm, I'm just taking some kind of a break because governments started to put privacy developers into jails. So really? yeah. And, um, and well, that's, that's not something where you want to go. Right. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, haven't you heard just, just two days ago or three days ago, the telegram, uh, CEO of the telegram got, got jailed in France. Um, Oh, because he didn't want to censor some some conversations that the French authorities wanted, so they they got him. My God! So yeah. so so what? Like there was some criminal case, and then like they needed a conversation for that, and they he didn't want to give it to them, or I think something like that. They charged him with a bunch of uh, different charges, like complicity, or complicity, and then all kinds of stuff, right? Like, mm-hmm. the the funny thing is that he 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 was originally a Russian citizen, right? Pa- Pavel Pavel Duro, I think that was his name. Anyway, he was originally a Russian citizen, and he 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 got away from Russia because he didn't want to take down stuff that the Russian government wanted him to take down, right? Yeah. So he got some other citizenship, like French citizenship, and now the the free word is 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 the one who's putting him in jail. Yeah, I mean, we are living in a scary world. Anyway, fitness. So, um, I I have a big question. I have a big question first. I want to understand the history of the I guess bodybuilding or fitness. So. I, I just tell you what I understand, and you are going to tell me like the complete history. So, 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 how I understand things have have been evolving in this fitness space was that in back in the days there were um, the Arnold uh, pumping iron on the Massa Beach uh, kick started this uh, this hey let's make our muscles bigger kind of. Uh, movement and mm. and 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 that was called bro science although they figured out a bunch of things and later on as research papers started to come out and stuff you know the, the early internet uh with lyle mcdonald and i don't know who else uh, maybe martin burkham um the early internet started to like 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 even with a certain kind of mentality that was not you know the I was not not the mainstream um mainstream magazine what what the mainstream magazines had or the diet feds right but mm-hmm. it, but uh, an evidence based uh, fitness community started to to be to be created or evolving and I think that's where you come in right so firstly t- can you tell me the the history of of the fitness community up until today and where you come in so from way back when so like what like from the origins yeah back in ancient times mm-hmm. when the greeks were so pancration in the olympics or so Freddy and Beni, they were the first <laughs> no so um arnold actually is is a relatively is a relatively late person in the history of all of this so those that have seen big bodybuilding competitions like the mr olympia which arnold won seven times you will see a trophy handed out to the mr olympia winner and that that is the the sandow trophy so eugene sandow he was one of one of the very very first big bodybuilding champions so now now i have some trouble pinning him down as far as like what year it was but i i mean it was not the not the 1800s but i mean i don't know it might be like the is there some something like that like or or earlier so like um it, it's really like only black and white pictures and like the whole it, it almost looks like 
looking at some ancient Greek like statue or something like that, not just because of the muscles, but also because it's just so antique. And so, you know, like in the beginning of the 20th century, these uh, bodybuilders were actually like, there was not really bodybuilding and then powerlifting. Basically anything that had to do with strength and muscles was just one thing. So bodybuilding competitions were actually uh, them having to show off their muscles, but also lift weights, uh, perform these feats to show off their strength. And so that was kind of the origin of that. Then that went on for a while. Eventually, the first like equipment manufacturers showed up. So they started creating, well, not machines yet, maybe, but you know, the, the first squat racks appeared and um, some very early iterations of the leg press. Uh, but like very, you know, like before a squat rack existed like people were not squatting like people are squatting today like they would just like pick up the weight put it on their backs somehow uh, before a leg press existed like literally like they would sort of like balance a barbell on their feet and then i guess like someone would help them so that it would stay on but they would be just lying on the ground and they would like push up a barbell with their feet so it's very funny to like read some of these write-ups of how training used to look like before we had all the tools that we have so by the time arnold came like i mean that was after all of that so like a whole industry had to be born for him to be able to do what he did at that level and so you know when arnold came around actually there is one more important thing so like the golden era that is what is the name that was given to arnold and frank zane and all of these guys when they were congregating but then there was the silver era before that, and that would have been the era of Steve Reeves, who is often looked at as the like the last or, or maybe like the first or the last great natural lifter, depending on how you look at it. Let's say he was the first um, fitness influencer uh, that was like world famous. We could, we could look at it, look at him like that. Uh, of course, without the internet, and uh, I mean even television was like not what it is today, but. He was the the first like strength and muscle based athlete who became famous just for being aesthetic and being strong, essentially. So uh, there are several movies with him. He's considered natural by many. I would say that based on his physique, he might be natural. Based on the reasons that people give, he could totally not be natural. They are saying that steroids were not available yet um it was by good account it was available already testosterone was pretty widely used already so we we don't know that but he looked really good and he became very famous so arnold already came after he could be influenced by people like him and so that that was the golden era and like really just if you're looking at pumping iron i mean there's a, a number of legends that appear in that movie so frank zane is iconic like he he was like after Steve Reeves, he was like maybe the first like aesthetics person, not just like a muscle monster, but like really like, like just a beautiful physique. And like that's still people aspire to look like that. And I mean, really from Arnold up until, I mean, truly pretty close to, to what would have been the earlier stages of the evidence-based fitness industry, which would have been like sort of um late 2000s like early 2010s like up until that point really the lifting culture that was created by arnold is the one that was kind of ruling everywhere which is sort of um sort of like approach to fitness based on the limited information that we had that was science-based and just a lot of intuition that's certainly how training was approached so you would not be looking at evidence of any kind. You would just look at, okay, like what feels like it's working. Like, okay, I'm getting a good pump. That means that the muscle is working. You know, with with nutrition, it would have been like, okay, protein is good. How much protein do we need? You know, a gram per pound, that, that should be good. But more is probably better. How many meals? Well, we don't know, but probably more is better. So I cannot eat every hour. Three meals a day is probably too little so let's just go for six meals so like that's that's really like what bro science is is just decisions made based on intuition and just what seems logical but oftentimes what seems logical is not actually how things are done properly 
And then, yeah, like the evidence-based sphere, like really, especially now, like looking back to those late 2000s, early early 2010s, that, that was kind of a, a, that was the golden era, I would say, of, um, or the silver era of the evidence-based fitness industry, because that was a time when someone showed up who looked somewhat fit or had some evidence showing that, okay, they actually know what they're talking about. Maybe they coached some people and and at the same time also understood science like that person could just say pretty much anything that was somewhat new and it was just mind-blowing to everybody so that's how someone like martin Burkan or martin berkan i guess would be the proper pronunciation he uh, he he was truly a, a a revolutionist and it was revolutionary at the time when he introduced intermittent fasting to the world like what, what is now so common knowledge i mean people in in hungary and and in any country that I've been to, like they talk about intermittent fasting, and like everybody knows what intermittent fasting is today, but not many of them have heard about Martin Burkham. But uh, is he still around? So he, I, I have not heard anything from him in a long time. Like there was kind of a big return that he made, like a couple of years ago. So he showed up once again, started posting on Instagram, opened the Patreon which did really well from what I heard. Maybe that is still around. I don't know. And then and then even started a podcast. And it was a good podcast. But then he just fell off the face of the earth again. So yeah. And then like that, that really started then. And then the, the evidence-based fitness sphere has grown so fast that now we have actually seen pretty much like the highs and lows of it. So now it has become like at first like science was something that needed to be made accepted by by the the fitness audience or audiences so like people were of the mindset that like oh man like don't come to me with science like i lift weights that's what i know i am the muscular one you're the lab coat person okay so like that was kind of the attitude in the beginning um someone like a lyle mcdonald who is Super, super smart, but he's not big and jacked. Ellen Aragon, who is also very smart, but is also not big and jacked. Like these people were received with a lot of skepticism. And that attitude is still around to some extent today that like, why would I listen to you? You're not big and jacked, but a lot less, but a lot less. But and and so now it has not only become, it's not only that something, it's not only something that became accepted but it has already become like a buzzword. Now it's already a marketing tool. So like the term evidence-based and science-based is is abused so much that it's almost becoming meaningless. So like now you need a really good bullshit detector if you if you want to be, well, worst case scenario, actually scammed and like giving out a bunch of money for something that doesn't work or, you know, Slightly better case scenario, just end up following some very foolish approach because it was evidence based. And so, yeah, like that, that's where we are today. Like at this point, everybody is evidence based <laughs> because that's the buzzword. I'm really bad at keeping things short, by the way. Just uh, I, I asked you to to make it long. This is this is important context because I I'm go I'm gonna ask you about longevity soon enough, but uh, just a little bit of connection there that. I noticed that, you know, in longevity, there, there were like mouse studies that, no, not just mouse studies, but there, there were studies that mTOR activation, you know, you know, in the, in the, in the bodybuilding community, mTOR, mTOR activation is good in the longevity community, mTOR activation is bad. It makes you live shorter. So, 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 so then, then, then the, the fork, folk knowledge the folk science of longevity of david sinclair and whatnot is that okay so we have to l limit the the amount of protein that how much we are eating and animal protein is bad the plant protein is 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 the best so 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 i see a change from this mentality from from proteins bad to there are people like peter atia or brech Brett Schoenfeld, who are, who are starting to look at the evidence-based community, like the people who 
you are surrounded with the people who Lyle McDonald is keep keep shitting on lately. <laughs> so uh, Brad Brad Schoenfeld Brad Schoenfeld. Wait, did I said Brad Schoenfeld? Did I? Okay, so yeah, I just that maybe at the wrong time because um, Peter Atia might yeah. be looking at Brad Schoenfeld. <laughs> No, no, so and Lyle so is, is shitting on him for sure. No, 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 there, there is a guy, there is a longevity YouTuber from New Zealand who is also something like. Oh, let, let me. Sure. Brett Stanfield. Brett Stanfield. Yeah, that's uh-huh. that's his name. So he's pretty prominent, and he's looking at Brett Schoenfeld. So, so that's what, what I was oh, okay. <laughs> mixing up there. Anyway, let's not get into longevity yet. But um, you didn't talk about yourself here. So where do you come in? Where do I come in? Um, what did you put on the table? <laughs> <laughs> I put able on the table. Where I come in? So I came in in the middle of all of that, actually. So I came in at around the time. I would say I just got introduced to this whole thing when evidence-based and and like what is evidence-based supposed to be, I guess. Like it didn't like catapult into like massive fame and notoriety that it has today, but it was about to. So people like Eric Helms and people like Mano Hanselmans and Mike Isretel, like these people were like already sort of big within their little like niche communities, not like such a household name within like, even like natural bodybuilding, let's say. So like even like there were natural bodybuilders that took it very seriously who would not know Eric Helms is. I doubt that there is that there are many today, for example. So like it 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 was sort of um just at the tipping point of it growing into something truly massive. And this would have been at like 2014, 15, like that sort of uh time period that we are talking about around that time like or up until that point I was basically just very passionate about lifting and um, you know working on my little physique also I was trying to be healthy I was also kind of into longevity I was into longevity a lot more back then than I am today interestingly which is kind of funny because I was rather young and so yeah like I got into it as a practitioner at first but then I also decided that like actually they say that you should follow your passion or whatever. Like I could see that there is actually like a career in it potentially beyond just being like a PE teacher or, or a in-person trainer in a gym. And I got into it. I was really trying to find my own angle. Um, and that pretty much like right after that is when it really catapulted into something gigantic. Like, like a good benchmark to look at is if you look at Jeff Nippert, and his ascension to being this gigantic YouTuber. I mean, at the time, right when I got into it, he was one of the very first people that I interviewed on my channel. At the time, he he had 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. Now he has probably 7 million or more. I don't, I don't know how many he has now, but that, that is sort of... And like that's big because he is an evidence-based fitness YouTuber, for example. And um, and maybe he was the first one that was like actually evidence based and actually like solid information and is also super super famous. So, um, so yeah, and like you know where I come in. I mean, I was always trying to find angles in this that would make me wouldn't say unique. Uh, although I, I guess I am because everybody is <laughs> in their own way. But like I, I guess I am because I was deliberate about. Like maybe I'm not going to be the best. I'm not going to be the biggest and the most entertaining. I'm sh- for sure not going to be. But I'm going to be talking about stuff that I just don't hear being talked about a lot. So, um, and, and that was sort of the sustainability aspects of all of this, like behaviorally more so than anything. So I um, was talking a lot about like binge eating and things like that, that I was like really struggling with. Now, I would not be very unique if I did that um, because a lot more people are talking about it today. But at the time, um, that was sort of 
something that people just try to keep in secret. So I decided to talk about it myself. Would cover topics like that and also just um was just always trying to reflect on things in an angle that I felt was somewhat somewhat different. And really as far as the industry on as a whole, I would say I'm a very insignificant player but because i think i'm fairly empathetic and i'm fairly compassionate and also knowledgeable enough to where i can actually like help people in practice i have a small but loyal sort of viewership that that is me in a nutshell but you disappeared i mean yeah a little bit now um i returned already but um yeah, I mean, life was happening uh, to me big time. And yeah, unfortunately, it's really hard, you know, like, it's really hard to be creative. And not that this requires that much creativity, but I couldn't even really bring myself to think about my even my own personal fitness during this period. And so really, this just um, for a while, I just viewed it as procrastination. And then I just said, Oh, man, it's easier, less stressful for me to just accept that this is a hiatus and I'm just going to fall off a little bit and then I'm going to return when I'm ready. And at that point, hopefully I still have an audience <laughs> to return to. So that's more or less how it went. What did you do playing video games? Well, I did. That was more of a coping, um, coping mechanism. So, so basically it was, it was things in my, in my personal life, uh, a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of, um, a lot of stress and a lot of yeah just feeling like there is not a point to anything i have fe feeling lost not knowing how it's gonna be really like like some of my so some of my hardest darkest moments which by the way like anytime i like sometimes i i cope with these things by thinking about like some horrible things that i did earlier like as a kid let's say like i can think back to when i was a little kid and i would hurt some little animal or something like that and like I mean, I wish I could undo those things, but I can't. I'm like, okay, like these things, I'm, this is my punishment for those things. Like <laughs> I'm trying to rationalize it like that. But yeah, video games were a very useful coping mechanism for sure. They, they, would, they would distract me like nothing else. Do, do you know why? It's uh, because games are, are a special kind of art form. It's a... Uh... It's a medium of, of of your agency. So it's it's not not a passive thing like reading a book or listening to an audio book or watching something. It's 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 something that you put yourself into a different agency. And what is an agency? It's goal and rules. So you have a clear goal and you have clear rules and what it does is that instead of being here as a person suffering away and not knowing what to do or what sh goal should I even have, you know, like uh, you put yourself into a game and then it crystallizes your goals. Now you have to go there and talk to that person to eventually get to that other um other thing but here is an obstacle and this obstacle has to be overcome and you have certain limitations of how you can overcome that obstacle however in your real life it's like like it's hard enough to figure out what your goals should be but the way the many ways that you can go about solving those problems are also like much more exponentially larger than than in a game yeah um, it's I'm, I'm yeah yeah i mean it is so so that is why that is why actually i find them so fascinating during this period honestly i, I my appreciation and my intrigue towards these games grew so much more but not not just as a user but like I was I was thinking about this exactly that like I mean what like first of all the psychology of like what makes a game more or less engaging or even addictive is 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 really fascinating and it's not at all 
what I intuitively would have thought that, that that's what it takes. So like I, I hear all kinds of things like, okay, this person loves video games because of the story. This person loves it because of like fighting and, and like combat and things like that. Like I would have thought like, okay, I love these sword fighting games. So probably like what matters to me the most is that the sword fighting looks very cool. Yes, that does matter. But like, yeah, by far the thing that makes it the most engaging is when it's challenging. Getting from A to B is very, very difficult. And then, but I do know what it takes or like what could be avenues to get there. And it's like, okay, if I could somehow get better, like a better sword, that could be good. But how will I get it? Well, for that, I need this resource. It's like, okay, well, well, like, let's go on this mission and collect that resource. And it's like, the whole thing is the crystallized, like, this is what needs to happen. But I'm not, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's going to work. But it's, but it's not like, it's not a complete certainty. So like, it's, it's, because if it's still in your zone of proximal development. And that is what? Are you familiar with the concept of flow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for, for. Video games are the best things that put you into flow. And Mm -hmm. in order for you to get into flow, there needs to be three things. One is that there needs to be instant feedback, like as as frequent instant feedback. So when you do something, then you know that that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. The second is, actually, I forgot what the second But the third is the zone, you have to be in the zone of proximal development. So if a game is super easy, um, that's boring. But if it's super hard, um, that's frustrating. But if it's just right enough, the difficulty for you to be in your zone of proximal development to keep improving, now that's then you're in a place where that's where you learn, you know? That's yeah. where you want to keep your children in all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 is, it, it is very, very much like that. And uh, also, like, so, so that's why when I was thinking back now, like, so like, okay, let's say there is this opponent. Let's say it's called the Joker. Let's say I'm Batman. I didn't play, play with that, but let, let's say. It's like, okay, if I know that, like, well, now I cannot beat the Joker, but if I go and get that special bat weapon, then I will just shoot him and that's it. Then, yeah, I guess it would be still, like, I would still go there, get the weapon and shoot the Joker. But it would not be so intriguing. I may even forget to do it and I would get caught up with something else. Because it's like, well, like, since I know that it's going to happen, like, what is the intrigue? But these games would always be like, man, like, this boss is kicking my ass. Like, I have absolutely no idea how I'm ever going to beat him, but maybe with that weapon, I could do it. So then the, the, there is this excitement element to it. And also like the, like, a, as you're saying, like if, if it's like, there is absolutely no chance I can ever beat this one, then it's sort of, it, it becomes just so frustrating that I, that I might just quit or I might, I don't know, call over a friend. Like, Hey, can you please kill this boss for me? But, these like these games that I was playing with, a lot of the losses that I would suffer, like they would feel like they would entice me. They would make me feel like I'm very, very close and I would always fall fall away when the boss would have like this much health and then and then he would kill me with some bullshit attack. And then it would feel personal almost. Now you're actually messing with me on a personal level. And then like these elements would would make the game so addictive that it, it was crazy. And sometimes like two, two, three hours would pass. I'm like, my God, it's already 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever. How the, how the hell did this happen? And, and I would not think about whatever thing was destroying me otherwise. It's, it is really quite incredible. And it very much can be a dangerous thing because like, I mean, sometimes it would actually be scary that I mean, a whole day passed almost on a weekend, let's say. And I I did not do anything. So, like, I I could actually just play myself to death. If I found the right games that are addictive enough, I'm pretty sure it could happen. Have you ever played God of War? So, I downloaded a... No, actually, 
on PlayStation Plus it's available. Uh, yeah, I started. I started. Eventually, I went with something else. But yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I never played, but uh, the story of it is is that uh, a man, what some some kind of Viking god or something like that. I'm gonna mm-hmm. butcher it because I've never played it. Yeah. But uh, but you're playing with that guy and v- v- and your and his son is is following around and teaching him stuff and you know trigger warning for our American listeners or <laughs> whatever. But I cut my hair uh, because now I look like that guy from God of War and now I'm gonna <laughs> play it with my five year old kid and <laughs> uh-huh. see, see what happens <laughs> yeah american so, listeners will be upset because kids should not be exposed to that or why i i uh, it, it is probably pretty brutal but you know like i want my kid to experience um things like that when i am there right yeah um also there should be a lot of father and son bonding there so Oh, that actually, like hard games are actually a very good way to bond. Like, like of course, I wanted to always play. I was happier when I played them when my friends played. But like, if it was like something hard and like I could not do something, and I actually just really enjoy just cheering for my friend. Like, like hey, like like do it. Like if, sometimes, like I would call my my brother, older brother. Uh, well, I only have an older brother, and then he would do it, and I I would enjoy as much as as if i was playing it so like if you give your kids something hard and then yeah you can you can be the hero who will pass some level for him that he couldn't (laughs) anyway so i was pushing this game conversation because i'm gonna get back to it but uh, but but first we have to talk about longevity so okay so what what do you know about longevity like how much does someone in the evidence-based fitness community hears about this stuff so it's not the main thing that i work with certainly like uh, i have no longevity clients most of what i learn about and have to inform myself about or really just apply to help people or just related to the vein side of fitness not the health side of fitness so you know building muscle and losing fat while those are actually some of the best things that you can do for your longevity longevity so so for health certainly but so so it's definitely strongly interlinked with health but but it mainly has to do with your vanity longevity is something that like I was very interested in at some point, so I I did um, try to learn about it, and and some things just overlap, you know. So it's like some some things that you will do for your aesthetics uh, or your vanity are also gonna be good for longevity, and then you know you will find out about it, and you will be like, oh, cool. I guess that, that's good because like you know a lot of the things that you will do for your muscle building and and being ripped sort of ambitions are not going to be so amazing for longevity potentially and so when you find out that it's actually overlapping then it's always a nice sort of uh, realization or surprise rather Um, like in general in life like often the things that make you acutely happier are uh, not going to be not going to be the best things for you in the long term and you know that certainly can apply to fitness like for example anabolic steroids if you're abusing those then it's definitely it's definitely not a great thing for longevity and so yeah i was i was very very interested in longevity when i was in like 2021 i would say that's when i was the most into the longevity topic Mainly because I was trying to preserve my youth. Like, I don't know, I just had this pathological fear of, yeah, basically just aging. Like, I always looked older. Uh, Other people tell me, like, I I cannot judge that, you know. I see myself too frequently for that, (laughs) to know how old I look. But people always told me that I looked older. Um, 
yeah, I started losing hair when I was 15 years old, started uh, growing gray hair when I was in my early twenties, which, you know, luckily still only now is my beard like legit going gray. But, uh, but like I definitely had some of these early signs that like, oh man, like I, I will look like a freaking old man, like very soon. That was, that was my huge fear. So because of that, I started getting into longevity a lot around that time. So I was actually um, consuming info about that a lot more than I would do these days. And then I guess like as my fears around that sort of started to go away as I grew up, grew a bit older and wiser, um, also my interest started to vein. But, you know, like I'm in the field and I do consume a lot of content around that. So or around just fitness in general, and inevitably I will come across things around longevity as well. So I would say these days, that's the most like organic or that that's the primary way that it happens sort of just organically. So you guys are not really measuring the length of your telomeres or, <laughs> or, or looking at biological uh, epigenetic aging cloaks, stuff uh, like that. Yeah, n no, no. <laughs> so that definitely not. Uh, some people are into it, like just to like nerd out, but. Yeah, we, we, we measure our biceps and uh, that, that's the things like that. And maybe weight. That's what matters. <laughs> that's, what, that's what matters. And then, yeah, and, and most, of, most of us would take um, a bigger, bi bigger biceps instead of bigger tel telomeres. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Games and sports. So what do you think on a philosophical level, what are the differences and similarities between video games and sports? It's actually good that you say that because I actually wanted to say that earlier that I think that's what actually drew me to a large extent to fitness back in the day. So when I, so it's not a coincidence. When I was into longevity a lot more, that's sort of coinciding with the time that I got into just fitness in general as well, like seriously. So I, I was into sports, but fitness, not so much, at least not consistently, other than like sometimes getting red, getting a bit leaner for a pool party or something like that. But I did get into lifting like in a more like regimented way when I was like really struggling with a bout of, I would say depression. I was not clinically diagnosable with depression most probably but i was um just really self-esteem issues feeling purposeless feeling insecure about like just about everything in my life um or every aspect of me and around that time i i just needed an outlet and so yeah i got into fitness because of that and and it was basically almost like a video game in terms of what inspired me. So like, okay, maybe this is going to help me. Okay, what is needed to get to where I want to be? Like, actually, my idea was that I'm just going to be one of these, like, I will turn myself into one of these, like, tough meathead looking dude, like like a, the bouncer looking dude, like the a God of War looking dude, if you know how <laughs> the God of War guy looks. Well, the, but you do, because you just said it, that you shaved your head to look like him, but like, yeah, so I'm going to be like this God of War kind of dude, like 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 big and tough and strong and and kind of scary looking. Yeah. And so, okay, what is needed for that? Well, like I need to work out, need to eat a lot more protein and whatever. And so, it is very much like that because like that's what I'm doing in a video game as well, like upgrading the character, like upgrading the armor and like learning new skills, like new martial art skills in in whatever Sekiro or Wulong uh, Fallen Dynasty like that's that is the thing that is the most entertaining or the most engaging like that that progressing from A to B and becoming this like stronger more agile version of yourself and like that that was the thing that like really hooked me in fitness as well and that's you know anytime I would go through some tough spell that's what I would actually do like I would get into something like I would set myself a goal and, and I would work on that like obsessively. So like, okay, now I'm going to get lean, like shredded. And then, okay, like each day, no matter what happens, there would be an end goal to that day. 
like if I hit my calories today, then it would give me like a sense of purpose, basically. Um, it was like, and the thing is that like it became just as counterproductive as video games can be. So like it was useful in that like it kept me engaged, but like it kept me so engaged that everything everything suffered because of that. So like I, I actually oftentimes accomplished nothing because well. I was thinking about my diet all day. Like I, I could literally spend a whole afternoon just planning out my macros, even though they were already planned out. I replanned them. And that's that's sort of like, and I know I'm not answering your question because you asked about sports, but like I, I think it is kind of a useful thing to just quickly touch on that. Like just as how like video games can be approached in that way that like, okay, you actually beat this game like, a hundred times already you know already what to do there is no real challenge but you just screw around you're just like lie on the couch and like you're just going through the same thing again and again like i would do that with fifa like the football game like i would just start like a new career mode like when you're like managing a team and like okay i will be with manchester united this time this time i will be with ac milan or barcelona But the thing is that like it was kind of pointless because I would just put together the same team again and again. I would buy the best midfielder and the best striker, always the same player. Like basically there was no real purpose to the whole thing. It was just passing time. And you can approach fitness like that as well, where like actually like you know what to do already. Uh, There is no real reason to think about this all the time or to let this consume everything. But because it's comfortable, because... um, because you already know what to expect like it's it's rewarding in a way to like okay like let's let's create like the perfect structure structure for my training and my diet i i guess that's like that's how a lot of people like fool themselves with anything that requires creativity or productivity that like actually like you're not progressing at this point you are just going through the same stuff that you already know again and again and again because that's rewarding but you're actually kind of missing the point of what it what this is supposed to be about so like there was that trap that i was kind of stuck in for for a long time but but yeah like there's definitely like the that mission element that like okay since i have this longer like overarching mission that okay i want to get lean because of that each day has like a mini mission Again, that's like a video game. So like main mission, but like submissions, like it's, it's often how it's split up. And then I guess like someone who actually does sports, I mean, it must be even more straightforward. Plus it's even easier because like you have an entire like infrastructure or ecosystem around you that is making sure that you're on track. So you have your coach, if you're a kid, then you have your parents who might be also like pushing you. Everybody knows already that like, okay, it's end of school. Like, okay, now I need to go to training. So it's a lot more straightforward in that way. Um, and man, I cannot even, cannot even imagine how it must be like to like getting, like getting ready for an Olympics, let's say. And like for four years, everything is about this one event. And then that event is over cannot even imagine how those people must be feeling like at that point but um kind of that's a bit of a tangent also what we can imagine is that isn't it a bit of a letdown that you reach 30 years old and from there on you're like there is no sport in the world that you will be able to compete anymore like it is only one third of your life and 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 what like you have until you're 90 years old and it's like that's the end of the sport right yeah yeah i mean i i mean it, it's both so as if you're actually an athlete who experiences that actually the whole thing is just very very bizarre if you think about it like like the timeline of them being like a youngster who is like too young to expect anything versus being old and like now he's too old to expect too much. I mean, the whole thing is like that that's a 10 year process. And like, if you think about like us, like just normal people, I guess, I mean, that timeline is still relatively short, um, but at least like it's like double the time, let's say. So like, uh, although if I think about it, so like, yeah, I, I guess if you're like a 19 year old kid, 
yeah then like you will hear things like oh you're so young like don't don't beat yourself up 21 you might still hear it but you might not like it depends on the culture like in the u.s like at 21 they are expecting things of you north macedonia they don't like in north macedonia they are also not expecting things of you at 31 most probably <laughs> but but in in hungary let's say like uh, yeah 21 like okay there's still like room for also like some schools like i graduated from high school at 20 and not because i failed classes it's just like the way it was set up um but yeah so like but at 25 certainly they're expecting things from you so like at, at 30 like um, it's not that it's too late, but it is too late for certain things. So like at, at 30, like they're kind of expecting you to have your act together already. If you're, or at, at least like be on your way there. But if at 30, like you don't even know what you want to be yet or something like that. I mean, they will be like, dude, I mean, uh, what the hell? And they're not going to tell that to you, but amongst themselves or like the person when they, say goodbye and like they go do their thing like they will be thinking man like I mean, this, this person screwed up his life or her life like that that will be their mindset whereas like so if, you, if you think about it like it's a 30 year old person there's a good chance that he or she will live until at least 70 maybe more like 80 or 90 exactly what did they run out of time for mathematically nothing but in practice like that's how people look at it and for an athlete like yeah certainly like yeah at 18 okay you're a youngster at 22 no dude absolutely no excuse not to perform i mean fuck like this hungarian swimmer now i'm forgetting her name now um oina something oina so she like i i read in in this article that like she gave the interview that i need to accept that I'm never going to be like some like generational great swimmer. Like it's just not going to happen. And I was thinking like, okay, like then how old must she be? I mean, maybe late twenties, like early thirties, like just thinking of like, when would an athlete come to that acceptance that like, okay, I, there is no point in trying that in the future it could happen. And it's like, okay, I was expecting like, okay, maybe 30 or so. I was seeing 22. And like the fuck, like it's a twenty-two, like, but but yeah, like I suppose because like at twenty-two, like those that will be generationally like great swimmers or any sort of athlete, like yeah, at twenty-two they already have things that like things to show for, like yeah, like Michael Phelps probably had a number of medals, Olympic medals at twenty-two. I'm not sure how many, but most likely. So. Yeah, it is. It is kind of absurd. How cool would it be if there would be a sport that, where the older you get, the more chances you have of winning these competitions? And guess what? You don't have to wait for it anymore because that's exactly what I'm working on right now. Uh -huh. Let me introduce you to Immortal Combat. Oh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so, so let, let's let, let's talk back a little bit. Mm, maybe maybe we talked about telomeres before. Uh, telomeres are the things at the end of your DNA caps at the end of your DNA, and that's the old school longevity metric. That uh, the the shorter your telomeres are, then the older you are biologically. But ever, mm -hmm. since then, people figured out new metrics like epigenetic aging clocks. Actually, it's Horvat clock was the first one. I don't know if that guy was Hungarian or not now that I'm thinking about it. it Although Horvat in Hungarian means Croatian, so... <laughs> yeah, but they okay. have... Yeah, but, but they have that name as well. So like, Hor, like in Macedonian, for example, it's Hrvatska. That's That's... Croatia, and I'm pretty sure it's something like that uh, in mm -hmm, Croatia as mm -hmm. well. So. Well, anyway, so then these epigenetic crooks started to gain momentum, right? Because how cool would it be if we could measure people's biological age as opposed to chronological age, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Um, so 
then Brian Johnson actually it it it's his you, you heard about Brian Johnson this tech bro vegetarian tech bro that goes around and sp and spreading uh the the ideas of longevity all over the media yeah is he the one with the big channel yeah he has probably a big channel and 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 big 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 everything uh huh yeah 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 so, so yeah. Mike Israel did a review video of him. It was pretty good, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You might want to check it out. His main scientist, Oliver Zolman, who I, by the way, interviewed, um, he figured out that, hey, it would be pretty cool to put create some longevity leaderboards. You know, people, you measure your epigenetic age and, well, uh, let's put you on a leaderboard compared to other people and then, and Brian Johnson teamed up with True Diagnostic and whatnot. And here we go. We have now something called the Rejuvenation Olympics, where thousands of people are competing with each other who can reverse their biological age the most, right? Mm -hmm. So what I started to do myself is I started to interview these rejuvenation athletes, right? So now my channel or my podcast, what I started to do after after I stopped the Bitcoin stuff mostly, is that I started to interview these rejuvenation athletes and 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 well, I'm trying to be on the forefront of the rapidly evolving longevity sport industry, right? I'm even considering of uh, maybe maybe I should should launch my own competition uh the the immortal combat <laughs> that's the working name for it uh but, uh, but but yeah so so, so the, the, this is what's what's happening right now and uh and and as you can see um i'm excited about it and how is it going so far oh it's going going great going great right it's uh i have a feeling similar to bitcoin in in mm. in the early days it's 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 the it's the it's the kind of thing when when people who don't hear the music uh see the people who are dancing as crazy <laughs> you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah. it has that early feeling that we are we are doing something big here because if 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 you if you think about it Sports are very good at setting motivation to people and getting people to 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 try out crazy things. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna figure out how to achieve longevity escape velocity by writing scientific papers and making incremental improvements and running um a bunch of rats in a laboratory for two years. Like that's 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 extremely so, slow process right that we need the scientific papers to confirm what we already with what we already um strongly suspect it's kind of like yeah. what the bodybuilding uh, community is mm, yeah uh, the bro science they figured out a bunch of stuff but because they were competing with each other right <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. after later on, the scientific papers came and, well, this was true, this wasn't true. So now all these longevity athletes are trying out really crazy stuff and, and trying to figure out which moves the needle. Um, oh, by the way, I, I mentioned it a couple of times and I never know who said it. So you told me a quote about, about a bodybuilding coach telling... Uh, telling his his guy that if you wanna be Mister Olympia, you are hmm. not. Can 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 you tell me this because I have to refresh my memory. I I said it so many times before, but mm -hmm. I, I forgot the specifics. Well, then actually I came up with it. Just kidding. No, uh, it was uh, it was 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 uh, Charles Poliquin the originator and he said listen like science is all great but if you want everything that i say to be backed up by a reputable study then you're going to miss the next 
three Olympias, or I've, I'm not sure what the number was, how many Olympias, but uh, you're you're gonna miss the next Olympia for sure. All right, Charles, Charles Polyclean. Yeah, he, yeah. Uh, okay, so he was a character. So, so that's how innovation works, right? People try shit out, and 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 some things are gonna stick, and 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 we'll see. I mean, there are people like 65 years old and looking younger than me, right? Like, what the fuck is going on there? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I I would I would love to know. Uh, and I mean, people have been talking about that for a long time, right? But I, I would also like would love to know, like, why is it like? Is there something like central that can be like measured that and and that explains like okay why do I like I was laughing at, I, I met a guy the other day at this meetup thingy and uh, like introduced each other and he like so so what age are you what age are you so like I, I'm 32 and I mean you know probably up. So I don't know what people now think how old I look, but if they said, if someone says 42, like I would not even flinch. Like, yep, sure. Like that's, I mean, when I was 22, they thought I was 32. So, um, and I asked how old he was and I was like, well, what do you think? And I was like 23, let's say. And he said, nope, like I will be 32. And I was laughing that like, well, okay, then basically like if you look at like how old people might think I am and how young they might think you are, there is like a 20 year gap between the two. And uh, so like, is it purely a cosmetic thing? Like, it's like, no, well, it's like I'm actually biologically just as young as he is. It's just like certain things just look different and we associate those things with aging um, or or is there something that is like more central to like the human, which is like actually a signal of your bio- biological age or or closest correlate? Yeah, would love to know. Yeah, so 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 the big debate or or the big questions are is that so there are these these epigenetic age crooks, and now the question is that okay, so what if I I if my epigenetic crook says that I am five years old, then does that mean that my biology is like a five years old? Or does that just mean that I succeeded to manipulate the epigenetics in a way that it is telling me a false biological age? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so is it a fingerprint? And am I like cleaning the fingerprints of my age or is it like some really deep causal relationship so so these are the questions right and so yeah it's interesting or, yeah or even um you know like for example when you get blood work mm-hmm. like there are certain things that you can do which will very reliably change markers that you're getting so like um like like for example if you drink a whole bunch of water or uh th- then like your blood viscosity will be different and so so like that is and and your blood viscosity for example is something that like someone could look at as an indication of like like this drug that you're taking let's say like how is that working for you and if it's doing if like if if the drug is indeed the drug that you want it to buy then it it should actually make your blood a bit more viscous which is not like a good thing generally speaking but like that could be an indicator uh or maybe that's an indicator that like well you should actually pay attention you should be more hydrated it's like well but then don't drink a shit ton of water before you go take your blood work if normally you wouldn't drink it like you want to know what actually the drug is doing to you and like you know could could that thing be that you're measuring something that is like really just um that is ma- ma- manipulatable but it doesn't mean that actually like you're aging less it just means that you managed to manipulate that one thing that you can measure you know what i mean mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah exactly okay so for for the last part I want to ask you where your strengths are 
so here for, for, <laughs> exactly exactly so 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 first my i just want to know the objectives here so what your work focuses on is how to get bigger muscles and how to have less fat is are there other objectives here other objectives as far as what um i work with and what people want to work on or in terms of like um in the longevity space people want to have slower biological aging or lower biological aging clocks and they tend to want to look younger right yeah. in the beauty industry play space they just want to look younger in yeah so so, so is in the evidence-based fitness community is is the fat loss and the muscle gain the main objectives or are there other ones like i know strength gain yeah um main objectives definitely that um now as far as yeah if you're looking at the industry that that's for sure the main thing strength is there's a very significant part of the fitness industry that is concerned with strength it depends on how you look at it you know like power lifter is that in the fitness industry you can say that but you can also look at it like well that's an athlete like that is power lifting is an actual sport whereas like um you know bodybuilding you can also look at it as as a sport to me that's more of a beauty pageant and then you know like uh, your like uh, i would say it's closer to the longevity field than it is to like an actual sport that that could even feature on the olympics or something so um so yeah like strength for people uh, like me is is more of a is more of just a, a measurement tool like just how you are looking at your telomere lengths or now this this other met metric that is sort of what strength is to us that's actually a very good analogy uh, i should have presented this whole thing more confidently as if i already came up with that beforehand but uh so very similar in that like it's probably it's not perfect ideally probably you would want to look at more things that are indicators of your biological age um but now you found this like it, it seems promising like okay this this is probably the closest to what you have i would say we are like strength is a step beyond that so like this for sure is a good metric that much we do know but it is far from ideal like ideally we would measure muscle growth like we, we could look inside the muscle and we would see what's happening like is it growing is it not growing we cannot do that so strength is actually the closest metric that we have like are we getting stronger so that is pretty much the extent to which we look at that um and like it's funny because like you know like the, the the fitness industry is is one where out of these two main goals which is fat loss and muscle growth so many so many mini sub goals are born that for pretty significant periods actually they can become the main goal main goals themselves so for example like i myself was never interested in treating disordered eating for myself I was never interested in treating injuries like okay how do i rehab my shoulder these things but like since i did develop some pretty significant disordered eating patterns and i did develop a pretty significant shoulder injury i needed to become like sort of an expert in those things uh, but that was never my goal <laughs> but it had to be simply to manage myself and like that's i think that's like if you're going to be an expert in how to get jacked and lean you will probably have to get pretty good at rehab strategies. You will have to get pretty good at, you know, eating psychology, disordered eating, uh, and how you manage that, like these sorts of things as well. So to that extent, there are other goals. But yeah, like vanity, so fat loss and muscle growth is definitely the two main ones. Okay, um, let, let's let's focus on that because my follow-up questions would get too complex of an answer if <laughs> if we, we we start with the sub goal. So, so okay. how do you move to get jacked, and how do you move to get lean? So, give my listeners 
a specific ideal training plan, two okay. specific ideal training plans for these two goals. What do you do to do these? O only training. Okay. So, so by move, you mean like how you actually move your body for them? Yes. Yeah. So, so to be big or to, to build muscle, you basically move in a way so that you, first of all, what you move is the muscle groups that you want to grow. So for most people, that's pretty much going to be the whole body. For men, obviously, like upper body is going to be a bigger priority usually. And for women, it's usually the lower body. So first, it's just you got to understand like what muscles we are talking about. But even if you don't, like you have muscles that you use for pushing, muscles that you use for pulling, you can even dumb it down like this. And to be honest, you won't be far from the truth. So you basically want to train all your pushing muscles in your upper body or your pulling muscles in your upper body. Simple way of going about it is just... Um, thinking about planes of movements so like vertical and horizontal so horizontal or vertical push and pull and then horizontal push and pull and um, for the lower body some sort of squatting pattern so that could be really anything like anything that mimics the movement that you do when you sit down on the toilet and stand up as long as you're as long as your legs are doing that, you're good to go. So a leg press is good. A squat is good. Some one-legged squat variation is good. And then a hip hinge, which is, um, if you think of like leaning forward and picking up a shopping bag from the ground or putting it down or picking your baby up and putting it down with your legs pretty straight, that is a hip hinge. So that's that's also a pretty useful movement because the squat is basically going to train the front of your legs and the hip hinge is going to train the back of your legs and the butt or your ass, both of them are going to train. And beyond that, you want to throw in some extra work for your arms. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what's, the, what's the hip hinge? Okay, so I get the horizontal push-pull and push-pull and squat, but hip hinge is like... Like this or, or, so or what? Hip hinge, yeah. So hip hinge, you stand up straight and you basically just bend forward. Ah, okay. And okay. Uh, with relatively straight legs. So you're not bending your leg intentionally. You're just you kind of try to forget that your legs even exist and just try to push your ass back as far as possible and you keep your back straight. A no, leg I'm... raise would not be considered a hip hinge. A, a, a what? Movement. A leg raise. So, so, so like you're the, the on a bar and you raise. Yeah. Yeah, almost. Yeah. But so it is, it is actually just uh, sort of like the the resistance is, is coming from the other direction, if you think about it. But like, yeah, you will feel if you just do a leg raise, um, you will feel your hamstrings, so the back of your thighs stretching. So... It's just the reset, like basically with that one, you're training your abs. If you raise up your leg with this one, you're training your lower back actually, but also, but mainly your butt, so glutes and also your hamstrings. So that, that would be the back of your thighs. So, so like from, and, and beyond that, you want to throw in some extra stuff to just round things out for your arms and your shoulders. So some bicep curls, some tricep extension things like this and from these movements basically we have what we could call like the big six and then so big six would be like vertical and horizontal push and pull so that's four movements in total right it is yes and then for the lower body you have your squat and hip hinge so, so that's six and then if you throw in on top of that like bicep curls any kind of bicep curl a tricep extension let's say like an overhead extension or a push down um, maybe like a, a, like a lateral raise or something for the shoulders, um, and maybe like a calf raise. If you add all of these together, then maybe you have like a big 10. So instead of a big six, and with that, basically you will train your entire body and you probably want to do somewhere between six and 10 sets for all muscle groups basically and from this 
you can already accomplish that. So if you do, let's say, three full body sessions a week, so you go to the gym three times a week, and you do basically just one movement from for like one pushing movement, one pulling movement, and one or two lower body movements. And you repeat that like three times a week, three times a week with that one, you're pretty much like covered already. Really like I would just, um, I would not go crazy with how many sets you do. I would, I would just go for, I would just go for training hard. Honestly, that that's more important in the beginning, especially than training a ton. Um, you can always do more later. So yeah. Um, so once you have your exercises after that, really the main thing is just, uh, the effort level. So it doesn't really matter whether you do five reps or six or 10 or 20, like people like to stress over that a lot. Um, luckily the answer there is pretty, pretty easy. You can do pretty much as many reps as you want, as long as it's actually hard. So if you do 10 reps, that's fine. But then if I hold a gun to your head and I ask you like, okay, how, how many more can you do? The answer should be maybe 12, 10 or 12, like some, somewhere in that range. If the answer is 20, then that's a problem. So like you only want to leave like one or two reps in the tank, ideally. Um, and basically like that, that is your like rep range that you're working with, um, which is like, there, there is no rep range really. Like as long as you're training hard enough, any kind of rep range will work somewhere between six and 10 sets for muscle group. Um, so, and by muscle group, so like your chest would be a muscle group, your, um, your abs would be a muscle group, your the front of your thighs, so your quads, that would be a muscle group. Um, really, like you want to look at each of these individually, like you will have to probably read up on that a little bit. And if you have these main movement patterns, then everything will be covered basically. But um, but you want to be a bit more systematic. So don't just do like, okay, I'm going to do like, let's say you want to do 10 sets. Don't just do 10 sets from like, okay, from this big six, so like 10 vertical pushes and 10 horizontal pushes, uh, be a bit more systematic than that. Like if, if I went through like all the muscle groups now, like then this talk would last forever. Um, but so somewhere between six and 10 sets per week. Um, and really like how you distribute that. So like, are you going to be doing, you know, five workouts a week and you're going to be training one muscle group, uh, separately on each workout, or are you going to do three full body sessions? Really, I would just make that depend on what's logistically feasible for you. So, because in terms of the actual results, it doesn't really matter. So, you can you can build muscle with pretty much any sort of arrangement. What matters a lot more is how many sets you do and whether you're training hard. So, if you do ten sets, you can get in ten sets by doing two sets five times a week, or you can you can get in ten sets by doing 10 sets in one workout. Some might be marginally better, but really most of them are equi are equivalent in terms of how effective they are. Um, so it, it really just comes down to logistics. Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that is that is basically in a nutshell how you move for building muscle. For losing fat, it's really like, it's not even, you can pretty much just not move and just... Um, Fat loss is more about not eating, but you do need to eat some to not just waste away. So you want to eat definitely your minimum protein requirements. Uh, that would be before before you go into eating. Oh, yeah, I wasn't so too much. But Carl, <laughs> I'm going to ask you about. So don't worry. <laughs> but uh, but Carl, you wouldn't you you consider that something that makes a difference or not really? Yeah. So. Uh, it definitely makes a difference. The main difference between how we think of movement for muscle building and for fat loss is that for building muscle, movement is essential. So uh, you can actually build some muscle even without training. For example, if you were following a very low protein diet and then you start eating a high protein diet, 
that will actually build some muscle, believe it or not, but minimal. So to go from like, like even to look like me and I'm not a muscle monster, but definitely more muscular than the average person. If you just want to get to that level, that's not going to happen without training. Um, whereas like to be 5% body fat, like as lean as the leanest bodybuilder that you will see, you can actually do that while sitting on the couch the whole time. It's just going to suck because like you will have to eat very little. So cardio or any sort of movement is really just there to increase energy expenditure so that you don't need to eat so little in order to create the calorie deficit. So it's really just, uh, it's giving you basically an energy buffer. You can think of your energy expenditure as your budget that you put aside and then the food that you're eating as like little like handfuls of cash that you're taking out from your budget and then yeah you can think of cardio as like basically like more money that you're pouring into that budget that you put aside so the bigger the pile of money is the more you can take out and still not run out of money and so that's kind of how it is with with cardio that like it, it is helpful but but really it's just um it's just a convenience thing because really like if you think about how we live it's it's actually quite depressing how little energy we expend day to day um even if you're a bigger person like a 100 kilo person might burn i mean barely more than 2000 calories uh if if they are very sedentary so you know if you want to create like a 500 calorie deficit which for a 500 a person weigh, weighing 100 kilos is actually not not a lot but even for 500 calories like you would have to eat like a 1500 calories i mean that's not that's, that's not a lot of fun Whereas like if you are fairly active, so you get in, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 steps a day and maybe you do some cardio beyond that. I mean, you, you could be eating closer to like 3000 calories <laughs> and, um, and still be in a deficit. So, uh, that, that's why doing some sort of activities is useful. Okay. So for nutrition, does it matter too much how you eat for building muscle but for is is there a reverse relationship here so for fat loss uh what matters is nutrition for building muscle what matters is is a uh, resistance pretty much pretty much mm -hmm. so it, it, it is pretty much an inverse relationship so for building muscle it's mainly about training and nutrition is there as a support mechanism. Whereas for fat loss, it's mainly about nutrition and training is there as a support mechanism. So you do, oh, actually, that, that is one thing. It's good that I said training and not cardio because so some resistance training is important if you want to lose fat. Uh, not, I would say not essential because like you can get lean, as lean as you want without any resistance training, but you're at, at a certain point, you're going to lose muscle. The leaner you are, the more muscle you're going to lose. So you're very overweight. You're not going to uh, pretty much any muscle you're not going to lose. Once you start getting, as a man, if you're getting to the point where you start seeing your abs at all, you got to start thinking about muscle loss potentially. So you've got to, you got to do some sort of resistance training. Uh, to prevent that and then once you start getting like really lean so not just seeing your abs but even seeing your abs without flexing them and your face starting to look very gaunt at that point you might actually not even be able to avoid muscle loss uh, altogether and, and and at a certain point that's why you cannot get leaner because even the muscle that your body is starting to eat up is getting too little and it's actually reaching to your heart muscles <laughs> And then obviously you're going to die. So that, that's why we have essential fat levels because at a certain point we, we cannot keep losing that. And at a certain point we cannot even lose more muscle. So, but anyways, so training, resistance training is important for fat loss to just preserve as much muscle as possible. Hopefully also to gain some while we are getting leaner. But 
it's really as far as fat loss as a mechanism it really like just an optional thing for the most part like for the process of fat loss it is not required to do any sort of exercise and it's really just nutritionally driven for muscle building it is so protein is important but since you know the protein requirements for building muscle are high but not astronomically high so you know for most people it's gonna be somewhere between 100 and maybe like i mean i would say 200 grams of protein but realistically more like 100 to 170 grams something like that for most people like that that's that's going to be how much protein you need to build muscle you know if you if you eat a very very crappy diet and it's not high in protein at all um i mean Crappy from a bodybuilding perspective, I realize for longevity, it might be different. <laughs> what what constitutes a crappy diet? Even then you're getting in some protein, right? Because like, except for pure oils and table sugar, I mean, almost everything has some protein in it. So you're going to get some minimal amounts in no matter what. And, you know, it's a dose response relationship between protein intake and muscle building. So, I mean, it's, it's you basically cannot screw your nutrition up so much that it would be completely non-viable for muscle building or it would be very very hard on the other hand like without the stress stimulus that is your training like you don't you don't have the most essential thing that is going to trigger trigger the muscle building process so like muscle protein synthesis which is basically the the process of creating the new tissue that you're trying to build that that is happening just by eating protein actually like some of these amino acids that are in protein or or triggers for that but it's it's a relatively small trigger if you're training that is that is like many many fold like you're elevating those synthesis rates so much higher um, I don't, don't know the biochemistry of it like in huge detail, so I don't want to phrase myself more fancily than <laughs> what is warranted, but that is how it, how it is. Like, it's basically an inverse relationship, like you're saying, that like one is essential for one thing and the other is optional, and it's the other way around for, for the other goal. Okay, and what kind of pills should people be chugging down? What kinds of pills? It depends on how ambitious you are. If you're very ambitious, then you're going to be... If you're health conscious... Yes, and we are very people, ambitious. If you're very ambitious, then you're taking the illegal pills that... <laughs> honestly, bodybuilding or muscle building is, is actually very uh, nice in the sense that you're going to be saving a lot of money once you learn about what are effective pills and what pills aren't effective. Other than creatine creatine monohydrate which is really one of the very cheapest supplements that you can buy other than that really nothing is not not nothing not, well if we consider that a supplement which i mean it, it is a supplement it's just like <laughs> for a lot of people it's just part of their morning routines anyway like you have coffee uh, but yeah caffeine and creatine pretty much like those are the two things everything else is not really helping with muscle building it's just like like beta alanine for example like i like how it makes me feel it's like this cool stimulant and it, it, it it's actually more useful for endurance athletes um ironically but you know i i like how it makes me feel like i also like the skin tingles that it gives me um but it's not really helping you with muscle building so caffeine if you're using it within the limits where you're avoiding addiction so that would be like up to 100 milligrams for most people then it's actually going to be pretty good it's not going to make a huge difference but it gives some nice potential performance boost but mainly honestly it's just a mental thing um, but the mental thing can add up over time so if, if it helps you pushing yourself harder in the gym then it's going to make a difference creatine is is actually is actually performance boosting but it also depends on how full your muscles are with creatine to begin with. So creatine is stored in the muscles naturally, but normally it's not saturated fully. But it's going to be more or less saturated for different people. For for someone who is following a, like a vegetarian diet, 
or vegan diet especially well then I'm, I'm i suppose like well i'm not sure if creatine would be fine with them but like i guess like you can well no you cannot i think there is no such thing as vegan <laughs> creatine i mean i don't know maybe, maybe maybe they can somehow produce it in, in some some super synthetic way but, but yeah assuming that that doesn't exist uh creatine cannot be vegan so for them it could it could actually be uh vegetarians it could be actually useful because they don't have naturally very saturated creatine stores because they are avoiding animal products so um so that 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 can be like i for example don't notice anything from creatine like i i don't even gain weight from it um i guess i just like have my store saturated enough just through my diet but some people like actually like they gain like two kilos they look fuller in their muscles and they are like measurably significantly stronger so um it's it's worth trying and since it's so cheap with basically no side effects to really talk about that are going to be noticeable at least for anyone it's it's worth using and that's pretty much it man all right so by the way i asked chat gpt is there vegan creatine yes like what vegan creatine is typically made from synthetic sources as creatine itself is naturally occurring compound found in animal tissues yeah. common examples of vegan creatine creatine monohydrate the most common yeah. and widely studied form of creatine often derived from synthetic processes making it vegan friendly well then there you go then vegan you friends go. use create use the nice synthetic creatine <laughs> okay anyway contrarian question time what is one thing that you strongly believe to be the case but very few people agree with you on Ooh. oh man there is there is a couple of well by these very stupid examples well does it count if it's like a specific thing like an event that happened and i believe something about that event and people don't agree it is necessarily stupid because people don't agree but you believe it right mm -hmm. <laughs> yes it counts okay so recently there was a an event where football player got convict no not convict he was charged with rape and beating up his girlfriend and but the thing is that like there is no proof we saw a picture of the girl but, like it was a picture that was posted of the girl with a bloody head and uh, said like if you want to know who this guy really is here is this then the picture was removed we don't know anything about like any kind of backstory and there is a voice recording where the guy is is saying some pretty horrific stuff but to, saying like okay like now open up your legs and it's like oh but i don't want to have sex and it's like i don't care you don't want to have sex like things like that but so the the thing is that like the things that he's saying are horrific but it's not like it's not not particularly a violent voice recording like the girl doesn't even sound scared like it, it's like you don't have the feeling listening to it like okay someone is gonna get like really badly hurt like the whole thing is kind of calm so it's just weird and the thing is that the guy was charged with rape and um, like domestic violence and then the girl actually retracted the charges and eventually the charges were just dropped and so the guy is is actually back playing football already who are we talking about he is a mason greenwood he was playing for manchester united he was like a one wonder kid like extremely talented and it looked like his career was gonna be over because of this um the charges were dropped and he's back playing football he's playing in france at this point and the thing is that like the like the number of the number of podcasts that i've heard videos discussing it where like people are just talking about this as in like okay there is this guy who is now back playing football how horrible is this Be because he raped someone and beat someone up and they are talking about it as as a fact like not even mentioning that like well okay we don't know it for sure like even as just the like for formality's sake they're not even mentioning it like they're treating it as like well no it's, it's a matter of fact that he he raped 
And the thing is that like this, this is something that I actually feel quite strongly about that I, I do realize that, you know, like the um, innocent until proven guilty, like that, that principle can be taken too far that like sometimes it almost feels like we are pretending to be stupid. Like, okay, come on. Like we all know what, like, okay, we, we don't have no proof, but it's so obvious. So let's not pretend like we know nothing. So that would be the innocent until proven guilty principle, like taken to its extreme. But I feel like like now we reach the point where it's like it's actually you're guilty until proven innocent. So it's like we like it became a fully politically correct thing to just jump to the end conclusion right away. And it's not the only case like this, but but this is the most recent one. And I mean, to as far as I'm concerned, like. People who have discussed this publicly have um, failed, failed as public communicators about this really big time. Because, like, I think that is, it's actually completely, completely wrong to do what they're doing. But everybody is doing it basically. Like, I honestly, I heard one person who had the same thought about this that I did, and that was like just some random caller who phoned in in some radio show where this was discussed. But every single person who ever spoke about this publicly was very much on the polar opposite end compared to me. So, so yeah, I guess that, that, that would be one very obvious one. The mob has made its judgment. Yeah, trial, trial by media. Why should people give you money? <laughs> because I'm poor. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> So, what value can you provide them in order yeah. to give you <laughs> real money? Look, 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 look. So, so let let me elaborate. Um, I ask this at the end of every conversation of mine because I believe it's a very important question. So, we are living in a market economy, right? And we are creating value, and we are exchanging that value with other people. And for some reason. Um, many people got their, this communist mindset in, in, in them that making money is some kind of dirty thing to do. And you know what? No, it's not. So I'm going to ask every single person who come on my show that why should people give you money? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, then you should better be thinking about that because you want to contribute to society and that's how you contribute to society to figure out the answer to that question. Right. Well, you know, the the funny thing is is that I'm... Uh, um, I'll say this on your podcast because why not? Sometimes I'm not, I'm not even sure if people should um, because the thing is that like what I do and what I specialize in is, is so, like I'm... If someone wants to know what to do to build muscle or, or lose fat, whatever, like my knowledge is, is up there, like at, at a very high level, like honestly, like these big names in the industry, like Mike Isratel, whatever, I'm honestly really not, don't think that he's better at that than I am in practice. Like, sure, he has accolades and whatever, um, and he can do a lot, many, many things that I couldn't, but that in, in particular, like getting someone lean or helping them build muscle, I, I don't think he's better at that. Or, or really almost anyone than I am. Like, I, I actually rank myself highly there. But, like, how many people really require someone to hire someone for that? Honestly, I think you can just get so much of this done without hiring anybody. Um, consultations, I believe in much more so. So I'm, I'm much more comfortable taking someone's money to talk over a specific issue that they have uh, just because I know that like I have, like I do consultations with others, clarify certain questions. And uh, especially if it has some like personal element, so it's not just like pure, like dry information that I need, but some sort of like, I need my mind to be eased about something. Um, or maybe it's something where there is no hard data and like to some extent we can only rely on experience, then these consultations with someone can actually help me a lot. Uh, when it comes to like working together with someone on an ongoing basis, I think like often the people who seek my services the most there, I'm like, uh, okay, like I'm happy to work together with you. I just like 
I'm always a little bit uneasy because I don't know what expectations that they have as far as like, what are they actually going to get from this? Because if they think that it's going to be some life changing thing that it's like, now that they are with me, like muscle is going to come on to them like this and fat is going to like melt off. It's like, no, man. I mean, like muscle building is still going to be slow. Fat loss is still going to be uncomfortable. Like you will, you will have to be the one who has to do the dieting and you will have to be very patient for all the, that muscle growth. Um, and so I just don't like, I, I believe that I'm tr I'm clear enough on that, but I still feel a little bit uneasy. Like are people delusional now? And, and that's why they hired me or they just think that this coach client relationship could actually benefit them longer term. That would be great. But yeah, like if, if you're really passionate about the things that I specialize in, which is this muscle building and fat loss game, then yeah, like you would be in very good hands with me at the same time. Like you can do a lot of this by yourself. If you just educate yourself a little bit, it doesn't even take that much. Right. Yeah. If I would be doing consultations, I would, I would probably do like a couple of hours every month, but not more. And mm -hmm. that would mean I would have to set the price to extremely high because I don't want to, I would probably set the price at something like a thousand dollar an hour. Right. And the supply is that limited. That's how much I am. Um, that's how much my time is worth for me. So mm -hmm. it must be clear to anyone who's going to take on that. And, you know, there are people who, who are, who are willing to pay that kind of money. And it is not, they are not going to be like, oh, a thousand dollars. And it's not that much money for some people. Like yeah. there are people who have a lot and, and, and they need an instant answer to this very specific question. How can I be private in Bitcoin? Right? Like, yeah. I don't think there is a single person in this world who knows the answer better than me. Mm -hmm. So if they, there are people who, who might need that kind of level of, I don't want to waste my time. I put a thousand dollar. Hey, uh, tell me how to be private in Bitcoin. So, so anyway, supply and demand. What is your current rate before the Bitcoiners attack you and demand grows and you have to, 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 to increase your, your rates? Ooh, uh, actually, that, that's a, that's a very good question because it's like now I had this little hiatus. Um, actually, don't know at the moment. I would have to look up what <laughs> what, it, what it was before. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember either. Anyway, anyway, um, thousand dollar. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chaboy Abel, the best personal trainer for Bitcoiners. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me.